So I'd like to now invite to join me Peter Rufsema, the director of the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience. So if he could come on screen. Hello. Hello, sir. Very Hi, nice Katrina. to hello. Very nice to see you again. Now, uh, when we had a chat before this webinar and we were I was saying, you know, what what's a good way to describe the link between Marcello's work and yours? And you suggested that he's the kind of the bystander because he's reading from the brain. And he's trying to develop tools to um, pick up consciousness where there is some doubt, whether there is any. You're not reading from the brain, you're writing to it, creating conscious perceptions. So can you tell us uh, more about that work, how you calibrate computer brain interfaces to ensure electrical stimuli inputs reach the level of attention? Thank you very much. The floor is yours, sir. Yes, so... So I can't. I would, ah, voila, I can see your screen. Great. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so today I would like to talk about um, the uh, how a stimulus may reach or may not reach consciousness. And the same stimulus sometimes makes it and sometimes doesn't. And I would like to talk also about the potential application of these findings. So in the world, there are about 40 million people who are blind. And many of those will not benefit from treatment in the eye because the connection between the eye and the brain is lost. So for those people, a logical approach would be to make an interface with the visual cortex. And people have started working on that. And that's also what we're working on in my team. And if you stimulate electrically a group of neurons in this region of space, actually it's what we call retinotopy. So it's basically a layout of the entire visual field in the visual cortex. If you then stimulate one of those of those uh, at one of those locations, one group of neurons, a subject, and it can also be a subject that has been blind for a number of years, will see a dot of light. And it will be a dot of light at that location in the map where you're stimulating. Now the goal is to have many electrodes there, thousands or even more so that you can create thousands or more dots of light at different spatial locations, okay? So, and now you can work with this like a matrix board along the highway. If you switch on one bulb on the matrix board, subjects will see a dot of light, but you can also create a pattern by switching on some of these electrodes, okay? And that's the eventual goal, a goal that scientists have long had. Now, this is the system that we would really like to build. So there will be a camera that takes in images from the outside world that then needs to be translated into brain stimulation patterns that should be meaningful, as you see here. They then need to be transferred to inside the brain. So there should be a brain chip that then talks to electrodes that are going to electrically, electrically stimulate the neurons. Okay, so that's the system we, that we want to build. Now, the thing is that if you stimulate with a very weak current, you are in a situation where the stimulus may or may not reach conscious awareness of the patient. Okay, so that's an important question. And a few years ago, we carried out a study where we looked at that issue. And here we first started with visual stimuli. So all the audience, I would like to invite you to look at this red dot uh, in the middle of the screen. And what I'm going to do is to present to you a stimulus that sometimes can be very weak. So now I'm going to present the stimulus, one, two, three. I suppose that most of you saw the stimulus. Now I'm going to do it again. One, two, three. Okay, so now it was more difficult. Try it again. One, two, three. And the last time, one, two, three. Okay, now my suspicion is that many of you did not see all these stimuli. And what we found in the study is that if you present a weak stimulus over and over again, sometimes if it's close to the threshold for perception, sometimes it will, and sometimes it will not reach consciousness. So what happens here? So what we found is actually that the difference is well explained by a theory that was proposed by Stanislas de Haane uh, a couple of years ago, who's, who called this theory the global neural workspace theory. And what happens here is that if you present a weak stimulus, it needs to be propagated to higher areas of the brain in a sufficient strength. Now, if you do so, then there is a process that he called ignition. And ignition actually causes a reciprocal interactions between different brain areas, such that if you take the stimulus away, it's a very weak and brief stimulus. 
that the activity pattern is upheld through these interactions. We call it the working memory, okay? Now, if you now present the same stimulus, in some conditions, it may not reach the higher areas in sufficient strength. Okay, if you then take the stimulus away, it will fade out and it will not be perceived. It will fail to reach consciousness. If the same stimulus, and that is due to the noisiness of the brain, kind of makes it out of the noise, then it can reach the higher areas and it can reach cause ignition, cause, causing this working memory trace. Okay? So this is background knowledge that we can use in the design of a visual cortical prosthesis because we're also stimulating these brain cells very weakly. And we're testing this now in monkeys and we in elect implanted in the monkeys one, more than 1000 electrodes. This is what it looks like. So here are all the electrodes. Each of these squares actually corresponds to 64 electrodes. And we are now going to stimulate in primary visual cortex, the first cortical stage of visual information processing and recording from the next higher areas to see whether if we, what we stimulate here, whether it's strong enough to cause conscious perception. Okay. Now, what we do here in this graph on the X axis here, we're stimulating with different current strength. And here uh, on the Y axis, you see the hit rate, the probability that the monkey perceived the stimulus. And you see that if we st stimulate strongly enough here in this case with 20 micro ampere amperes, the monkey always sees the stimulus. If we then reduce the strength of the stimulus, there's a threshold here, 12.6 micro amps. And then the animal reports it about 50% of the time that we give the stimulus. Now, the interesting thing is we also had electrodes in a higher area, area V4, to which we could record. And what we observed is that if you give weak stimuli, you basically see no activity in area V4. If you give stronger stimuli above a certain threshold, then we start to, to see activity in area V4. And the interesting thing is that the activity in V4 as a function of the current level resembles the perception. So if we give about 12.4 microamps, then the activity in V4 is basically half maximum. So we can basically use the activity in V4 to see whether the stimulus is on its way to reach conscious perception. That's very useful. Now, another important question is, if you then stimulate one electrode, the animal is seeing a spot of light, what happens if we stimulate a pattern of electrodes at the same time? So to find out if the monkey then perceives a pattern, we train the animals to report 16 letters of the alphabet. Okay, so we present the letter D. Now, you can't ask the monkey, what did you see? So we had to train the animal and we trained him to make an eye movement into this choice display. Okay, so if the animal saw a letter D, we expect him to make an eye movement to the letter D in the choice menu. And now the critical experiment is we're not going to present this visual stimulus anymore, but we're going to stimulate a pattern of electrodes, okay? Aiming to recreate a letter by directly interfacing with the brain hoping that the animal will report the corresponding letter. Okay, and this is the result of this experiment. All these green dots are locations where we can create a, a single spot of light, a phosphine. But now we're going to stimulate multiple electrodes at the same time, trying to create a letter. And the blue dot is where the animal directs his eyes. We try to create- You have, uh, you have a minute? Yeah, I'm almost done. So here, okay. the, electrodes, we, the electrodes are stimulated in the, in the shape of a letter A. Now it's an L, it's a T. Okay, so this is very exciting to us. It's the first time this has been demonstrated that pattern stimulation of the visual cortex can give rise to pattern perception. Okay, so this is an important step towards this dream of creating an interface with the visual cortex of blind people and we hope to be able to go into humans in 2023. Although, don't be too angry at me if he, if he can't make this work. Okay, so what we demonstrated here is that variations in consciousness of weak stimuli are related to failures of propagation from lower areas to higher areas. And this knowledge will help us in the design of a visual cortical prosthesis. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I'm only, uh, I was only giving you time signals because we have so much activity in terms of questions. I have one and then I'm going to invite your colleagues back. I mean, so clear the, the end result, the importance of your work. That's, that's critical when we talk about practical applications and medical use cases. But there's a science fiction element, isn't there? Of course. I mean, if we're talking about putting AI between a camera and a brain, and I talked ethics with Mavi at the outset, what do we need to be careful about? Should we be wary? Yeah, so there's definitely uh, an ethical dimension here. Um, so there have been patients that have been implanted with electrodes in the visual cortex. And the simplest thing you can do is simply look for contrasts and present the contrasts in the visual fields actually on the brain where they are be de being detected. That's a very simple algorithm. But you can also make it more sophisticated. Suppose you're a user of the prosthesis and you want to cross the street. You don't want to see the trees, you want to see the vehicles, right? So then you might only want to select those, uh, those electrodes that correspond to vehicles. It can be useful, but of course there's an ethical dimension here because now the algorithm is deciding what the subject will perceive and what not, right? So therefore it's also useful to have these uh, ethicists on board within the human brain project.